Hello, my name is Frank Terranova and I'm the Executive Chairman of Adderton Resources. Uh, we are listed on the Toronto Ventures Exchange and the American OTC market. Uh, we are a uh, explorer slash developer specialising in the Pacific Rim of Fire in, uh, in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere looking for uh, multi-million ounce deposits. Good to meet you, Frank. Uh, we've not met or spoken before, so I'm, so I'm always intrigued with uh, new stories. You've got to be one of the best named CEOs, Terra Nova, for what you do. Do you hear that a lot? Look, at, 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 at the end of the day, <laughs> um, I get commented comments on my name and my looks. Uh, hopefully, uh, the results will, uh, will equally follow. But... but uh, no, much appreciated. <laughs> both good, both good, I'm sure. Hey, well, look, given we haven't spoken um, before, and I, I don't know the story, and I, and I want to kind of just try and understand what it, what it is that you set out to do. So why don't you start off with the whole business plan component? So what did you, when did you start? What did you set out to try to do? Absolutely. Well, look, probably about 18 months ago, a group of guys that I'd worked with previously, um, we looked all around the world at various projects and various jurisdictions. It's a pretty simple rule when you've done it for a couple of decades. If you want to find gold, go where gold is found. It's that simple. So we looked in the Pacific Rim of Fire, uh, PNG, uh, all in that part of the world. We looked in Nevada. We looked in South America, all the likely places. But PNG or Papua New Guinea um, was a wonderful cost of entry. Now, the company was spun out of an existing Australian stock exchange listed company that, that does industrial minerals called Maya Resources, and, and they do renewable energy as well. Gold and copper was non-core. Um, they weren't getting any value for it in their, uh, in, in their market cap. The opportunity to spin it out um, presented itself, and we thought, well, let's take these assets and really make something uh, of it. Um, so the one thing that we specifically looked at, and again, from experience, most juniors look for just one project. Um, I specifically went to find two. And the key criteria was they needed to have been neglected by circumstance. So not owned by every other junior, drilled like Swiss cheese and regurgitated because the market was a little bit hot. We really wanted projects that were just owned by the, the inappropriate um, uh, owner. So that's where the opportunity lies. Okay, so you ended up in um, PNG, uh, um, Fennel Island and Ferguson. How do you pronounce the first one? Yeah. Ferguson Island and Fenny. Fenny, Fenny Island. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you got two, two, two projects there. You've got a little bit of data that you, you, you've inherited. It's all quite, well... It's small at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the team, though. So what, is, what relevant experience have you got in terms of being able to take assets like this and develop them? Yeah, look, I think the last time we went to PNG, myself, my CFO, and a couple of the guys were involved in a company called Allied Gold Mining. Now, we listed it on the London main board. Um, it had it, it, um, uh, graduated from the AIM market. We were listed in Toronto as well and the ASX. It was a uh, compliance nightmare. But the company with the team and the leadership of its founder, uh, we went from 50 million market cap to 800 million over four years. Um, it ultimately got sold for just under 600 million once we got into production. But ultimately, the, the aspect, the graveyard is riddled with junior companies and teams who think it's a walk in the park. Now, we picked PNG because, you know, you and I could go out with a wheelbarrow and shovel. We're going to find gold. That's easy because Mother Nature did all the hard work for us. It's turning it into value and money for investors is where the magic or, or the hard work resides. So we've done it in the past. We went back there because we thought it's a trade-off. PNG is not everybody's cup of tea. I think it's better than a lot of jurisdictions, but it's not overly well known yet. But the geology, you know, the place has produced pound for pound more T1 world assets of scale than any other small part of the world. And we thought 
if you're going to go looking for elephants, it's the right place to be. Yeah, no, we, we've interviewed a few people like uh, uh, K90T and Kenantu, uh, yeah. uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and PNG. So we want to say it's a good jurisdiction to do business and it's well endowed. But as you say, saying it and doing it are two different things. So again, can you come back to some sort of key learnings from Allied Gold that you are looking to implement here? Or is it just to say, is it just, well, you know, we, we think we've got enough data here to make it interesting enough for the market and we'll, we'll play that game. So what, what are you going to be? Are you going to be building something big or is this just an exploration play? How do you position yourself? Look, absolutely. And that's why we picked two assets. And, and I thought, look, when the market is hot and there is money all over the place, people want you to chase the elephant. And Fenny Island is our elephant. With not a lot of investment, we've already grown it from 650,000 ounces to 1.4 million ounces plus with six months of work. Now, that's not because our geologists are special. Hopefully, they're not watching this. It's the, it's the geology. It is going to be huge and it's a function of how much capital you deploy. We believe at Fenny Island there is a copper porphyry monster at depth Ultimately, we will find it, someone will find it, it will be huge. Um, but that was the, I suppose, one side of the coin. When the market isn't hot and gold is out of flavour, investors want near-term cash flow, they want production. So Ferguson Island, we thought, okay, this thing, it's going to grow, it's going to be big, but it's already established where within three years you could be producing gold $40, $50 million a year of free cash flow. Um, it's not sexy building things. And this is, the, this is the challenge. People love discovering. It's like the Melbourne Cup or the English sweepstakes or what have you. They want their 100 to 1 return. But when you do the hard work to build, develop and create things, you're usually guilty until proven innocent because most projects take longer and they run over budget. So we thought we'd have a foot in each camp um, and that would give our investors optionality. For those who want the, the roll of the dice, Fenny is definitely it. One drill hole, we're a $200 million company overnight. But you plan, you hope for the best, you plan for the pragmatic. Ferguson Island could be in production within three years and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a boring story if all you're doing is producing 40 million bucks of free cash every year and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's not bad for a junior. So, but the lesson learned, and your question is a very, very good one, you need to be disciplined and have a systematic um, methodology. If you get tempted to drill the Hail Mary holes and, and, and wildcat it all over the place because you need news flow, Great, but 99 out of 100 will go broke because it is just you, you, you're leaving it to lady luck. So we look at assets and projects and we go, there's good data to start with. We know where the gold is, but you've got to do the hard work and convince independent technical experts to sign off that the gold is really there. You know, I believe there's 5 million ounces minimum in each project, but... So what? You know, I'm the company. You want independent validation, and that means spending money in the ground and, and, and doing the work. So, you know, PNG, as you alluded to, it's not a sugar hit unless you get lucky. So for those who invest in companies like K92, wonderful success story. You couldn't give that asset away 10 years ago. You know, we, got, we at Allied Gold got offered it for a dollar and we thought it was too expensive because it was a train wreck. You get the right team, the right commodity, the right time. It's a billion-dollar-plus company. So that can happen quickly but not overnight. So that's that's the the experience that we bring to the uh, to the table. Okay, look, you, you're using a lot of pragmatic language there about being sorry language about being pragmatic was great and, and slightly flippant about producing cash as well in equal measure there so but if i'm looking at your share price if i'm looking at your market cap and the amount of money that you, you you've raised previously it, there's a kind of disconnect between people understanding Absolutely. the way that you're going about this right i'm not saying there's a disconnect because this thing is you know way undervalued i'm saying there's a disconnect in the way that you're telling 
the story or yeah. the narrative in the marketplace and people's understanding of it, right? Yeah. And that's a problem for you because, you know, Finney Island, 1.6 of, you know, um, uh, million of, of inferred. That's okay. That's a good start, but you need to explain to people what, what does that actually mean? What do you, what do you get? What is the process that you're going to go through that to move that through to something like an M, get, get an M and I number on this thing that people yeah. can, you know, it's a, joke for you guys. Oh no, you're TSX, aren't you? Of course you are. Um, <laughs> sorry, it just says you're in Brisbane. I got confused. Um, and, and, you know, give people a number that they can hang their hat on. And where's the money coming from to do whatever that plan is? So can you maybe just, rather than talk generally, like get, let's get hone in on the projects, which you think is an elephant, which is Fenny Island. So how do you move that thing forward with the cash that you've got at, to hand at the moment? Look, it, it, it's a really good point. We need to pick our favourite child out of the two. And the reality is Fenny Island, the potential that it has, it's probably going to be too big for us. You know, and, and I say that given where our market cap is, given the capital that will be required for that project. So ultimately, um, and it's all the process has already started. And, and I say that um, uh, not, in, not in a flippant way. Now that the borders are coming down, that, that, that business development teams can travel and do due diligence as opposed to Zoom and they're on the ground and they can, they can look at things. Um, I suspect it will be a earn-in or a joint venture or something that is absolutely the next league, someone who's got a real balance sheet. Now, having said that, we're not here to give things away and in an ideal world, we'd love to do it ourselves. Um, but in reality, for investors to actually get there in real time, it's going to need partnering. So we're, we're going to continue to progress that asset to demonstrate its exploration targets and potential. Um, can we write the $10, $15 million checks to find the, you know, 10 million ounces that's probably there and all the copper? Well, not in my lifetime is probably the reality, unless we get the other asset being Ferguson Island into cash flow three years down the track, and then we use that cash flow to go back and deliver on Fenny. See, so that's, the, that's the interesting bit. That's the interesting bit, Frank, because you know you th that model, get into cash flow, that's a very Aussie thing, right? The Canadians, North Americans, drill the bejesus out of this thing and work yep. out what the, the edge, edges of the envelope, as it were, which is the, the Fenny Island task. So you've cho you, you're choosing, you're an Aussie, you're in Australia, but a TSX uh, V company, you're going with the Aussie model, you think, which is let's get focused on Focus Island. Let's do what we can to move this forward to, uh, you know, some near term cash flow scenario where I think we can go and raise some money to actually get it into cash flow. So may maybe I, I started with the wrong project there. So tell us, Focus Island, what, what's the game plan there? Well, Fer Fergus and Island, um, I have been absolutely guilty in underselling that asset. We picked it up for great value. Uh, the vendors, thankfully, you know, that they, they took shares in the company and, and they were in the business of pegging ground and finding the right vehicle. And I'd looked, I've looked at this project probably on and off for the past 15, 20 years. Um, and from that perspective, it's always had potential. So when we looked at it, I thought, oh, this is going to be, to use the, the, the vernacular, a nice little urn. It'll probably produce a few hundred thousand ounces. It'll wash its face. It'll keep the lights on, et cetera. The interesting thing was when we went drilling, all we wanted to do was confirm what we thought we bought. The exploration team, not only did they confirm it, it exceeded all historical um, drill results and expectations. And we thought, hang on a minute, this actually is going to be a multi-million ounce deposit and project in its own right. So you've hit it on the head. Do you uh, drill out these projects to their full potential, which is a Northern Hemisphere model, and then find somebody with the right pockets to scale it appropriately? Or do you try and um, get one probably suboptimally, but you get it in a production and you try go your own way? That comes back to ultimately quality of your share register and investors. And we got off to a to a rough start. And that that paints the picture 
in a typical Quentin Tarantino movie, we'll start at the end and we'll go back to the start as to how we got here. Um, we raised $10 million. The objective was, I thought, we needed 10 to demonstrate the potential of both assets. Now, in hindsight, $5 million was high quality, long term, call it, you know, smart money. $5 million at the time came from, I'll call it subprime momentum, call it what you like. So it's, it's there one minute, it's gone the next. Great, we got that, we, we banked the check, but the share price volatility and the disruption on our share register, it's like anything when people start to sell for no reason, but they're moving on to the next one. Um, Sometimes where there's smoke, people think there's fire. And despite our results, and my CFO coined the phrase probably better than I ever could have, he goes, all our bullets, we hit the target and the bullseye. The problem is the bullets bounced off from a capital markets and investor relations perspective um, because we took the money, we said we would do, we did what we promised our investors we would do. We doubled the existing resource. We demonstrated these things are seriously going to be spectacular. But the market went great. Um, you valued at three bucks an ounce. We've got the sharks all over us saying, you know, you can't discover gold for that price. So, you know, at these levels, investors will have great optionality. Um, and, and I say this with the greatest of respect. As a public company, you for sale every day of the week. So we're here to make shareholders money one way or another. The fact that we got off to a rough start, um, the structure, the listing, um, at all junior companies when they look at listing, it's the path of least resistance and the quickest route to getting listed and raising the money. You know, in an ideal world, if we had to do it again, we'd probably do it differently. Um, but how, how would you do it differently? It, I, I'm always intrigued cool. by this because, you, you know, there, I agree with everything you're saying, right? You know, if you don't have the right type of investor in there and they're selling down, it's a massive overhang for you in perpetuity unless that you deliver whatever it is that's in their heads whatever yep. that may be, right? So what would you have done differently that would have made a difference? I think, and it's always with hindsight, and I must declare probably 80% of the, um, we did a reverse takeover where we put the assets and the private companies into an existing, call it shell, shell entity, et cetera. Now, the main shareholders and the sponsors of that shell have been wonderful supporters and long-term shareholders. But there's probably, and at like now, probably in UK, there's these special purpose vehicles in, in Toronto, not dissimilar. You can invest in shells and who knows what you end up with and as, as a uh, ultimate um, exit strategy. So I suspect we had a small rump of shareholders who were hoping for a cannabis deal, a Bitcoin deal. They woke up one morning and found that they were the proud owners of a gold mining or gold exploration in New Guinea and probably thought, what's just happened? So they bailed. That's, you know, you're over the age of 21. You can do whatever you want with your own money. But again, we probably would have done a fresh IPO and done a front door listing. Therefore, everybody would have known exactly what they were getting into as opposed to a, a very efficient process, but one that ultimately comes back to bite in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so, so that's, that's good comments. Okay, so structure of the company in terms of where, where it starts from, share register, that, that's one thing. But you did get 10 million bucks. So would yep. you have done anything different about the way that you spent that? Uh, definitely not the way that we spent it. And we were very upfront. And, and the thing, why people have backed us in the past is that, we guarantee anything that is within our, our control, so obviously we can't control the gold price and to some extent the share price, but we delivered the exploration results which exceeded um, everyone's expectations. We did it faster than we said we would despite COVID. It was under budget and we said, you know what, we will get to the end of October. 
with two and a half million in the bank and way up where to from here. And by that, it's do you raise more money and keep continue going based on your results? Do you look to partner with larger companies, joint venture your assets? Do you look to throw the keys and give your shareholders greater optionality as part of a larger company? You know, it's their money. We're here to make the best return possible. So from that perspective, we've gotten to the end of October. We've announced all the results. We're really, I suppose, calibrating the final bits of technical information that's that's still outstanding. And it's no secret, junior companies that don't produce cash flow have to go back to the market and raise more money. So until we rip that Band-Aid off the wound, the share price is going nowhere because everybody's waiting for us to announce when and what is the next capital raise. So that's precisely the real world. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of interesting, actually. Look, and we're going to talk a little bit hindsight here. So, And that's that's always an easy conversation for people like me. But for, for you, who were there, were there at the time, it's, it's hard to see the wood for the trees in terms of decision-making. So I think by dint of the fact your share price has done what it's done, and I'll give you some leeway because obviously precious metal market has come off for equities. Price is okay. I think the price is okay, but the equities have come off. People are looking elsewhere. And, and, and so you're, you're working in that environment. So timing, I, I guess, hasn't been your friend in this case. But if you look back now about the way that uh, you, you spent your money, surely you'd say, with hindsight, I need to work to deliver headlines that the market will care about. Do you think you could have done that? So with hindsight, do you think chasing this bigger resource was the right thing, given your strategy? Seems to be. Do you know what? I think we can get into early production. Not, a, you know, we've 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 only got 175k of, of indicated here, uh, 340 of in, inferred. Maybe we can bring some of that, more of that into into indicated. But let's set that project up to get into production. Show people that it is a very near term producer and therefore near term cash flows. Maybe that's the way to go. And by the way, in the background. We've got this massive re, uh, re potential of this elephant with big resource. Do you know what I mean? In terms of that narrative, of telling the story, I mean, how do you, how do you, how could you have played it with hindsight in the oh, market? We're just I, saying. I, yep, I, I think, and the lesson learned, and I remember it from you know 10, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, maybe a little bit guilty of falling for the trap that um, if you do the hard work and you deliver the results, the story will tell itself. Well, it never does. So I've seen crappier uh, stories, projects, companies that, geez, they market well and their market cap has no bearing to the quality of their assets. Now, is, does that sound like sour grapes? Absolutely. <laughs> That's the reality of it. I'd rather have a lot of hot air and happy shareholders that ultimately the chickens come home to roost. The problem is we are now starting from a, a, a base that needs to be reset. At this valuation, you know, it, 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 it can only go one way. Um, but in hindsight, um, I, had, I probably, the company did not appreciate the importance. When people said to me on the Ventures Exchange, for every dollar you raise, you should spend 20% of that budget on marketing. And my initial reaction was, mate, that is a lot of metres that you don't drill in the ground. Like, what's the value? Well, guess what? There is value if you market and tell the story um, appropriately. And that's the one regret that I think I, I, I do have, that we probably could have been far more promotional than focusing just on the dare I say, of discovering gold ounces. Well, there you go. There's the trials and travails of, of running a junior company, especially you know down, down at this level, sub-100 million, right? Be we always talk about four pillars in terms of the, being the, the management team, the finances and the ability to finance plus marketing. At this end, all four are important, but it's all four hard to do because you can't afford to bring the people in who can deliver on all, all of those, right? So I, no, I, I, do have some, I do have some sympathy, but at the same time, you find yourself in a position now which is you know, like I guess a little bit is but market driven and decision making some decisions that you've made which maybe you, you you would do differently, where you've got to get yourself out of this hole. So do you get more focused 
We're going to say, right, we've done enough on our Fenny. We're going to park it up for now. You know we've got that and it's going to be big, but we need to focus on giving you this one. What we've got a so you kind of got your um, asset diversification, and you've kind of got you've got that de-risking component. But you've done enough and spent enough on that. Do you go onto Ferguson and go big, and do you go out to market and say, give us X amount of money? It's difficult at eight nine million market cap. Give us enough money to move this forward far enough so that you guys get comfortable and believe that we're capable of delivering what we say because it it. it it's tough. Otherwise, you sit here static and flatline for a long time, and you got to wait for another you, you, 2020 to come along. Look, you, you've hit it on the head. My philosophy has always been at the junior end, you grow or you go. So you can grow organically. You can grow through M&A when you've got the right currency in your share price. But to stay static, whether it be the AIM market or the TSX Ventures Exchange, at certain points, there are hundreds of companies that are basically zombie organisations that do nothing and, 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 are, and are captive. So from our perspective, the irony that I face is that the next um, component of capital is always the most expensive for juniors. And that's the migration of being an explorer into a developer. I've had more financiers and you know international from all corners of the world say get your mining lease and we will gladly fund the construction and put you into production but at the moment you're kind of half cooked so good luck if you find the money and you get to the if you get to second base we will bring you home but you've got to get to second base and that's the challenge and Look, we'll raise money, but it will be expensive, you know, and, and juniors are captive. It's not the cost of capital. That's when, you, when you're a more mature organisation, you can have that debate. It's access to capital. So, you know, you are a price taker despite what you think. So we're in the process of trying to come up with uh, uh, funding uh, strategies and, and approaches that get us to second base. And at second base, it's it's far easier the next steps than than getting to second base, if that makes sense. It, it is. And you know, I want to talk, I want to talk to you about that. It's not the cost of money. But it, 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 it kind of is in the minds of, of, of retail, right? They go, oh, the cost of money is so expensive. But if you don't do it, you're dead. There will be no future money. There will be no future share price growth. Okay. So, so there's a degree of uh, you can refinance that out at some point if you get into production. But it's also the type of money. I think that's the more dangerous thing, yeah. right? So expensive equity, going to market equity, okay, not ideal, but it's better than these, what are, what are they What do they call them? We do alternative financings. We do structured financing. That's where you guys get tied up. And it makes it very unattractive for the next round of money that's got to come into the company. So you've got to do this dance of getting the, not just... There's as affordable uh, capital as possible, but the right type of capital coming in without the conditions uh, associated with it, right? So you, what do you, you do? You've hit it on the you, you've hit it on the head. Shareholders in these sort of companies who've been there and done it, you will ultimately the best way of not getting diluted is to follow your money and participate pro rata, and you will always own what you own proportionately, average up do average down, do whatever. Absent that, we are faced with one of three options. Shareholders get diluted because we have to raise more vanilla equity, but at least they're all equal. We're all at the same table eating the same bread, be it stale, garlic, or whatever you want to call it. You introduce an alternative capital structure. Well, you have almost sold the farm um, and you have to shoot the lights out to really to, to, to share the spoils with everybody else. Now, that is really the last roll of the dice. If you can't find money anywhere else, another saying that I've, I've had for the past 20 years, the name of the game is to stay in the game. But, and, and those sort of structures are really, again, the last roll of the dice. The third one is don't get diluted at the equity level, but guess what? You've given away 50% of the project to another company, so you now are the proud owner of 
50% of Fenny or Ferguson Island, whereas at the moment we own 100% of both. So at some, our job as management is to really minimise the pain that's coming to make sure that there's a real opportunity to not only recoup but make money, at, you know, as this, this is a medium-term play. So you, you're spot on. If, if you end up letting the fox into the hen house, Mate, it is going to get ugly. It, it always does, actually. And funny you use that phrase. We, we interviewed a company last week, and I think literally on the front cover was the last roll of the dice. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that, that welcome to the casino, right? And sometimes yeah. it does get to that point. And you know, but I was surprised to see it on the front cover of a, of a presentation. Um, with, with regards to um, Ferguson Island, so what, what are we looking at here? I've mentioned some of the numbers, but what do you know from the historic uh, data and, and some of the stuff that you've been doing, which leads you to believe you can get into production economically? Yeah, look, I think ultimately we started with half a million ounces um, and a, and there was more there, but because of uh, the, the historical drilling was done in the 90s, a lot, of the, a lot of the data couldn't be accepted because of QA, QC issues. There was, you know, core was terrible or non-existent, whatever. So we had the treasure map as to where historical gold had been found, but it needed to be done in a contemporary manner. So we drilled it. We exceeded our expectations. We looked at the cutoff grades. We looked at the opportunity to extend. It, you know, it, it, it's grown. I truly believe, and again, you know, whether it be Adderton Resources or another incarnation, there is going to be three, four, five million ounces of gold extracted from Ferguson Island. Now, the dilemma, and you, you, you were very astute in your point, do you get into production and try scale your way up or do, does somebody drill it, really find the prize and then scale it up properly and appropriately? And that's purely access to capital. So for us, look, we will either get into production ourselves or somebody will pay the right price for a project that is shovel ready with a red ribbon around it and shareholders will get to choose um, whether they stay in and and reap the ultimate rewards or what have you, and but, but our come, job but, is to give. But come back yeah. to the question of of what do you know about the the ability to do this economically? Like what what grade are we talking about? How shallow is yeah, it? Yeah. All of that kind of good yeah, stuff. Look, look, it is the beauty that we loved Ferguson Island for was it was at surface, so the gamut of deposit is you know a hundred meters deep, the Wapaloo deposit is fifty meters deep. I call this aggressive gardening. It's not even mining, you know, to, to be brutally honest. It, it, it's, it's, it's going to be low-cost mining. So we then look at the economics. Um, the material is refractory. We're not, we have no aspirations to, develop, to produce gold bars on site. We will produce a high-grade concentrate and ship that into the, you know, Asian region to one of the Chinese, Korean smelters, et cetera. Um, because, again, it's the path of least resistance. So we're comfortable that the economics, based on some preliminary assessments that we've done, there's a couple of other projects that are in development construction that are very comparable. So we, we know what it's costing them. We know it, what it will cost us. Um, it's, so it's, it's not a matter of um, if, it's a matter of when. Um, is it a project that's going to move the dial for Anglo or Barrick or Newmont? No. But for a mid-tier company that is looking to add some near-term production, um, if we're not doing it ourselves, it's a walk in the park, you know, because it will simply be he or she who has access to capital will actually reap the rewards. So Ferguson Island's pretty, pretty easy but four, it needs to get bigger. And that's what, if we raise money, we will go back, as you alluded to, and we will drill it out further uh, because two million ounces sounds better than, you know, sub one. Um, and, uh, and it will then demonstrate the scale for somebody to say, you know, this is compelling. 
um, you know, for, for, for an existing producer to, to just want to bolt it on if we don't do it ourselves. Got it. So, so in that case, at the moment, you how much cash have you got left? I, I know 5.6 back in yeah, June. Yeah, two, 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 two and a half mil. Right. So what have you been doing since June till now? What have you been spending that on? Look, pretty much not a lot other than where we've done all the, um, we've started metallurgical test work to understand what the recoveries might be on Ferguson Island. Um, we're looking at some of the um, additional analysis to understand the copper potential on Fenny. So we've really been waiting um, now to uh, to really where to from here. So we've, we've hang on. When you, when, when you say that, sorry, you, you're five, you, well, your your PowerPoint talks about five point six million uh, back at the end of June, and you take two and a half mm, now, yeah. and you say I haven't done really much. So. Well, what, sorry, what's the between, burn rate? sorry but, but yeah, but between between June and September, that was where most of the Fenny drilling took place. Gotcha. So okay. Fenny Fenny was originally delayed because and, and therefore that's that's what we used the money to drill Fenny out. Sweet. Okay. So given well, I'm not sure I quite understood the answer or if, if there was an answer with regards to, to Fenny. Are you parking that up now? Have you done enough drilling on that to satisfy yourself and the market that there's more? Look, in an there. ideal world, we, we, we do want to go back and drill a few more holes. Um, to what develop end? Develop targets. Yeah, oh, look, I, th I think it's understanding, and, and Fenny was historically drilled to about 150 metres. So that's where all the gold, It's look, it's a really young system. It's a million years old. It's still extremely geothermically active. And I say this without exaggerating. If you don't have the right blowout protection, um, prevention um, on the drill rigs and you haven't got an A-grade drilling company, um, those drill rigs can end up in California like rockets if you hit a geothermal system. Um, and we experienced some of that. You know, it is really active. There is at surface mud pools boiling. It's, you know, it, it's still moving. But, but historically, 150-metre drill holes, that finds the low-hanging fruit. Any copper porphyry system is probably at 350 or 400 metres of depth. It's not cheap drilling that sort of, you know, those sort of holes. We drilled five. We got a lot of big runs of gold, but it's such a large system that we'd like to go back and try identify a bit more of the copper potential, recognising that on one side, our neighbour, Lahia, is one of the largest gold mines in the world. Our other neighbour is Panguna or Bougainville Copper, which is one of the largest copper mines in the world. So we sit in the middle. Um, it's just, again, it's a matter of when as opposed to if, but it's going to take some deep pockets. Okay. So with the two and a half million that you've got, that I don't know, what's your GNA? What's your burn rate? Oh, look, it's, it's probably about $70,000 a month if you factor in, uh, you know, all the insurances, the audits, the compliance, the you know, the, the costs that we incur. So it's, um, you know, and, and that's with pretty light on marketing again. You know, if uh, um, in an ideal world we'd have a, uh, a dog and pony show and, you know, clowns falling out of cars and all the rest of it as far as a very huge marketing budget, but we, we, we try to keep it pragmatic. Okay, so salaries, all that kind of stuff, all, all, all in there, 70000 a, a yep. month, right. Um, okay. I just want, I want, I want to be sure I walk away from this conversation understanding the strategy. Yeah. So you want to do a bit more at Fenny Island. Uh, to what end? You've got these neighbours you talk about, gold, copper neighbours uh, you, you talk about. What is it that you think you need to present to them? It's not like you need a resource. If you do drilling, they could, they're going to reinterpret your drill results anyway. Yep. Do, is that what you're going to spend, you know, what little money you have left here on Fenny Island? And then uh, you know present that and maybe bring in a strategic one of the one of those two or or other strategic partner. I mean, to, to what end are you, do you want to do more? Yeah, look, work I, on that? I, I, absolutely. I think the work pre any new capital being raised, we probably won't do any more work on Fenny. Okay. Um, and Understood. the money that we've got, that the money we've got left, and and I say this because it's an opportunity for investors, but it's the real world. If we get an opportunistic approach, given where our valuation is, um, we need to be able to afford advisors to make sure that we get the best outcome for all our shareholders. So we're really in a holding pattern 
we're finishing off the, you know, dotting the uh, the I's and crossing the T's on all the technical work we've done on Fenny and Ferguson Island date, because it's been very, very successful. But to progress either asset, we've got two choices. We either wait, raise more money and go hit them hard again, or we do incremental work, more likely on Ferguson Island, where you can start your environmental permitting, you can start your baseline social surveys, all the things that you ultimately have to do. Um, and it's not expensive, it's just time consuming. So that's that's the strategy, but ultimately we do need to raise money to, um, you know, and, and the thing that we pride ourselves on when we raise money, we spend it quickly in the ground because investors don't want us to sit on their cash. They want us to drill holes and find things, and that's that's how we go about it. Okay, so so I'm walking away from this conversation. I think right, I, we need to raise some money, but I'm going to be really clear with you about what the money's for. We can move Finney Island to a point where it's going to be interesting for strategic investors to come in, either people already yep. on the island or on or, or, or PNG mainland or new, but we know what we've got to do to make it interesting for people to uh, come in and yes. interpret our data, okay? so And that's not going to take a lot of money, but it's something that we've got to do if we are to create value and do some sort yep. of far format, right? I understand. Yep. Ferguson Island, you've got, if you do the slow burn of we will apply for our EIA and we'll apply for whatever licenses we need, permits, it's, going to, it's a long, slow burn and probably a long, slow terminal decline because people it aren't interested in that stuff, cuts. right? Not interested exactly. in that. So with this new money, you've got to say to people, we think we need X amount of money to get us to a point where we can get into production in the next two to three years, at which point at an optimized level, we could be 30 to 40 million free cash flow a year. That, that's that's the set. That's is that the pitch? That is exactly it. And look, it's even if you if we break it down into um, smaller bite sizes, depending on how much you can raise or might raise, the next lick of capital at Ferguson Island will say, guess what? You're turning the existing resource into a seriously measured or indicated one and a half million ounces. It is there shovel ready to go um, and, and that's that's what we'll look at. Now, in an ideal world, we'll have a mining lease and have everything ready to raise development or construction capital to get it into production. Um, you know, that'll probably cost, to get it into production, give or take, it's probably $100 million. Um, but the payback on that, if you're producing 40 to $50 million of free cash a year, is not long. So, okay. you know, we, yeah. But is, is there a way to come at that? Again, I just I want to, look, you, you, you did I Allied Gold. I get it. That kind of went, everything went right. The timing was right. It was all good. Money was a bit easier, right? But here with a company of this size, if you're going out to market and saying, I've got a small resource. You need to, because you're going to need to get to a million and a half uh, to, to be able to raise 100 million, you're going to need to. Is there a way, because I'm thinking of the rocks, golds of this world and the allocate, um, God, anacondas of this world. These guys have gone and raised money with a half million, 400,000, 500,000 ounce resource, admittedly higher grades than I think you're seeing here, and they've got into production, but with smaller capexes. It, uh, how, how do you get that balance right? Because going out and asking the market for 100 million, at goodness knows what market cap you're going to be then. Uh, yeah. Again, a toughie. Look, I, I think at the time when we look to get into production, it's likely to be a combination, and this is where the art and the science may converge. Um, straight debt. It might be debt. It may be equity. It will be a blend. It won't be the toxic style of, um, uh, you know, give, throwing the keys and rolling the dice, so to speak, but it will be a function of um, the, 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 the pool of capital will be far greater and more accessible when you've got that baseline resource that, you know, you can see that, again, you will either wrap a red ribbon around it and somebody will pay a significant premium more than you've, you've, you've you know, invested yourself or you go to the market and you say, guys, we need to construct something. It's going to be, uh, you know, a couple of years payback. How does it work? And that will be a function of the market at the time. Okay. 
Well, I, think, well, I guess we're running ahead of ourselves there. But a bit to do. So if you if you if you are coming to market looking for more money to be able to do what you need to be able to do at Fenny Island, what do what you want to be able to do to advance Ferguson Island. What 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 are you thinking? Ballpark would be would make. Oh, look, I think look. The reality is somewhere between now and February, um, depending on the um, robustness of of the market. I'd say anywhere between five to ten million dollars is is the right number. You know, would I love more? Of course I would. Am I a realist? Absolutely. So you know, I'm the one thing I don't want to do, and it's a trap that juniors always fall for, is if you need five, take the pain in one hit, as opposed to raising a million dollars on the hope that the share price will be higher tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. I call that the you know the greater fools theory. Um, I've never seen it work unless you get lucky with the drill rig. And if you get lucky with the drill rig, well, that's a, that's a game changer anyway. But you don't want to be known as a serial capital raiser that is coming to the market every five minutes because why would you buy shares on market when you can, you know, wait for the next placement, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got to be meaningful. It's just getting the right balance that, you know, we, we, we don't want to excessively dilute our shareholders but we do need enough to get it to from first base to second base yeah yeah yes yeah, so yeah again di- different companies have different strategies there i mean as a banker i kind of would agree with you take take the pain early and then go and do something with it meaning but you're going to do something meaningful but uh, i can see why retail do rail against it um hey well like frank um thank you for telling us that story i understand what you're trying to do here, and like I say, some there's some decisions you've you've got to make. But first things first, got to go and raise that money um, in, in the marketplace. I mean, again, do you think doing it pre-Christmas is smart, or do you leave it to the new year would be even smarter? Hey, look, the one thing as a executive of a junior mining company, you need a thick skin. Um, hence why I'm wearing a red shirt. It, it, it hides the, the blood stains from uh, shareholders uh, writing in. Um, but uh, at the moment, but look, it's largely driven. If gold spikes 100 bucks overnight, there will be money flying all over the system. If gold drops 100 bucks, we're just, we've got enough cash to wait it out. And that's, that's the, the rationale or the method that's behind the madness of why we wanted two and a half million bucks left in our treasury. Because if it's going to be a cold winter, then we've got enough to get through. But, you know, again, um, we're, we're largely captive to the market forces. Brilliant. Frank, good to meet you, mate. Uh, see you soon. All the best. Take it easy.